Joe Aridi was in a state of bliss, savoring some delicate, creamy ice cream. He couldn't understand why the man in uniform looked away abruptly. Joe entered the empty room with a smile on his face, where for some reason he was left alone, and the air suddenly became heavy. His head dizzy and his legs giving way, Joe remembered for a second that he had left his toy train in the cell, and then he stopped breathing. Joe Aridi was executed for the rape and murder of 15-year-old Dorothy Drain. However, the mentally retarded Joe didn't commit any crime at all. The confessions were knocked out of him by unscrupulous policemen. Apologies for false executions followed for 72 years after he was executed. If Joe knew that ice cream was his last meal, he might have asked for something else. Many believe that the last supper before the death penalty is the legal right of every criminal, but this isn't the case. A meal cooked at the request of a death row inmate is a tradition rather than a right. And as you know, traditions are often more set in stone than official laws. The very first evidence of the last meal before an execution is mentioned in the Ernamu Sumerian Code, which dates back to the 22nd century BC. In ancient Rome, a magnificent feast was arranged for gladiators the day before the alleged death, which was to take place in the arena of the Colosseum. Gladiators were most often slaves, but still had a higher status than the criminals sentenced to death. However, there is very little evidence of the last meal from that time. Presumably, deathbed dinners were also widespread in the Middle Ages, but more substantial. Regular information about this practice appears much later. The most well-documented evidence goes back to 18th century Frankfurt Amman. A maid named Susanna Margarit Brent fell madly in love with a passing jeweler. However, for him, it was just a fleeting entertainment on the way. He left, leaving the girl with a broken heart, under which a new life had been born. Due to the severity of the morals of that time, Suzanne was forced to hide her illegal pregnancy throughout the entire term. On August 1, 1772, when the child was born, the unprepared maid dropped him. The baby fell headlong on the stone floor and after a second stopped breathing. The frightened girl panicked, not knowing what to do in such a situation. The pain of losing a child tore at Suzanne's heart, but the fear of responsibility for the baby's death was stronger. She hid the baby in the stable and fled. Soon the body of the child was found and the maid was accused of murder and sentenced to death. Shortly before the execution of the sentence, the girl was invited to a meal from the executioner. Suzanne entered the large room where the table was literally bursting with food. The poor maid seemed to be a guest at a luxurious feast. The girl looked at the mountains of fried sausages, exquisite meat delicacies, and the dishes with baked carp, but did not see anything. A dark, impenetrable veil covered her eyes. Suzanne seemed to have lost the ability to perceive the world around her, its tastes and flavors. That evening, she just drank water in silence, not noticing anything around and expecting the inevitable end. She was cut off on January 14, 1772. Similar events were also held in 18th century London. On the night before the hanging, the prisoners were allowed to have a party with food, drinks, and guests, even outdoors in the fresh air. This mainly concerned wealthy or titled death row inmates. On the day of the hanging, the perpetrator had to walk a three-mile path from Newgate Prison to Tyburn Fair. On the way, the convicts were allowed to stop at the pub and drink their last pint of ale to refresh themselves for the last time before they died. The executioners usually joined in too. Especially notable prisoners were given other privileges, including being beheaded in a more honorable place. For example, the English courtier, Walter Raleigh, was beheaded in the Old Palace Yard at Westminster. Before decapitation, he was allowed to smoke a pipe. Tobacco at that moment for Raleigh was sweeter than air. The irony is, is that he was the first person to bring tobacco to Europe. On the other side of the planet, in America, even before colonization, the last meals were practiced as part of a ritual. The Aztecs would feed and deify a person for about a year, who was subsequently sacrificed to the gods and eaten. Usually, these were captured enemy warriors. 
the man's flesh was served with corn. It was primarily eaten by the one who captured the victim, as well as his family members. When the United States was formed, many of the traditions of the colonists remained in Europe. So at first, the last meal was not practiced in a new world. However, during the 19th century, a similar tradition began to emerge here. At first, it concerned mainly alcohol and cigarettes. For example, the murderer, Manuel Fernandez, asked for brandy and a cigar before his execution. The governor of Bellevue Prison did not deny the criminal his last wish. Fernandez greedily drank a bottle of brandy and then accepted his death with a tear. By the beginning of the 20th century, food was added to drink and tobacco, and the Last Supper was firmly in the realm of capital punishment. If the desire of criminals to eat well before death is intuitive, what is the interest of the prison guards in granting this request? If we talk about antiquity and the Middle Ages, the reason lies mainly in prejudice and superstition or religious belief. It was assumed that the ghost of a well-fed criminal would not take revenge on his executioner. Bad food before death could anger the future spirit, so they tried to make the last meal as tasty as possible. Through the meal, the soul of the executed is reconciled with the executioner and with his own destiny. Some Christians see this dinner as a parallel to Christ's Last Supper. Knowing about his upcoming execution, Christ shared the bread with his disciples, including Judas, who betrayed him, and indirectly turned out to be the executioner. By the same principle, Louisiana jail warden Burl Kane invites condemned prisoners to dine with him and his guests in casual Christian conversation. However, in the United States at the end of the 19th century, other justifications for this tradition prevailed. According to researcher Scott Christensen, the then American press picked up stories of the last meals and circulated them because readers liked it. This gesture gave the impression of the humanity of the death penalty. At the same time, it was a logical step towards the general humanization of prisons. Corporal punishment was replaced by lengthy imprisonment, and public executions were transferred to prison courtyards. On the other hand, the last meals continued in some ways the old traditions of public executions. Families used to go on picnics with food to watch someone being hanged. Now the criminals ate their own dinner without unnecessary spectators, and the people read about it. With the development of the media, executions were not shown, but their publicity remained, and newspapers wrote about them. Reporters meticulously described the menu of the last meal and literally documented the last words of the criminal before their execution. The inmates' requests, surprisingly, are often not distinguished by sophistication. Most criminals are at the lowest rung of the social ladder, so for the last meal they choose dishes that they are used to, but which are not on the usual prison menu. For example, fried chicken, sodas, fries and cheeseburgers are popular. Sometimes, prisoners add to the request those dishes that are traditionally considered elite. Lobsters, shrimp, filet mignon, and many other goodies that the criminal could not afford during his lifetime. In some cases, the prisoners themselves write a recipe, according to which they ask the cook to prepare their favorite dish. Some chefs have to fulfill such special orders for years. For example, Brian Price, who was sentenced to 15 years for raping his ex-wife, cooked more than 300 last suppers in 11 years of imprisonment. He put his soul into every death menu hoping in this way to atone for his own crime. Sometimes inmates do not eat alone, but shared food with fellow inmates, while the death row prisoner himself asks for additional portions for his comrades. Some prisoners show an extraordinary sense of humor when they ask for the last meal. Wilson de la Roy, who killed a man while in prison, was sentenced to death in a gas chamber. The killer asked for a pack of indigestion pills. When asked why he needed it, he replied that he would soon be faced with a large amount of gas. The guards laughed through tears at his joke and then carried out the sentence. Other prisoners, on the other hand, take the last meal very seriously. They are trying to give some kind of religious or other more majestic meaning to the last meal. The killer, Victor Fager, asked for a single olive, but with a bone. And he asked to put the bone in the pocket of the clothes in which he would be buried. 
the executed man, hoped that in this way, an olive tree would grow from him, symbolizing peace, hope, and rebirth. Some prisoners refuse to eat their last meal at all. Mostly they do so as a sign of contempt for the entire prison and law enforcement system. Others just don't see the point. Barry Lee Fairchild, executed in Arkansas in 1995, observed that the last meal was like filling a car with gas without an engine. Often the description of the last supper of a death row inmate can be found in the press, but you should not believe everything that the newspaper publishers write. Take, for example, David Castillo, who murdered the salesman of a liquor store. He was executed in 1998. His special dinner was relatively modest. Four servings of tacos, six servings of enchilada, two servings of tostados, a milkshake, and a few more items. But the journalists found it boring, and they slightly embellished reality. They replaced four tacos with 24, added a couple of burgers, and, in general, they made the convict seem like a big glut. However, there were indeed exorbitant requests for the last meal. In 2011, in Texas, convict Lawrence Russell Brewer ordered a whole feast for himself. He was served two grilled chicken steaks, one pound of grilled meat, a triple bacon cheeseburger, meat pizza, three portions of fajitos, an omelet, a plate of okra, a pint of ice cream, peanut butter bars, and three bottles of root beer. But the culprit did not even touch any of the above, because when death is on the nose, a piece does not go down the throat. However, this so angered Texas Senator John Whitmire that he canceled the last meal tradition. According to him, Brewer did not give any comfort to his victims before killing them, which means he should not be comforted either. Now prisoners sentenced to death in Texas eat regular prison food before execution. In the rest of the states, the practice of the Last Supper continues. Perhaps it is worth noting one of the noblest requests of the last meal. Robert Anthony Madden asked to give his dinner to a homeless man. According to the prisoner, food would be more useful to a homeless person. However, the prison authorities refused his request. But the general public was most moved by another case. Ricky Ray Rector killed two cops. Realizing the horror of his actions, he put the muzzle of the pistol to his temple and pulled the trigger. The killer survived, but the justice system decided to follow through. Before the execution, Ricky ate chicken and steak, washed down with cherry soda, but did not eat the pecan pie. When asked by the guards, he replied that he left the pie for later. The guards realized that Ricky did not realize that he was being led to his death. The bullet damaged Ricky's brain so much that he lost much of his cognitive function. The touched guards took the pie with them in case the execution was canceled at the last minute. On this light note, we come to an end. Write in the comments how you feel about the tradition of the Last Supper, or as they say, the special meal. Do killers deserve a little consolation before they die? And is the death penalty even necessary in the modern world? Share your opinion, like this video, and subscribe to the channel.